Welcome to Up My Hockey with Jason Podolan, where we deconstruct the NHL journey, discuss what it takes to make it, and have a few laughs along the way. I'm your host, Jason Podolan, a 31st overall draft pick who played 41 NHL games, but thought he was destined for a 1,000. Learn from my story and those of my guests. This is a hockey podcast about reaching your potential. Hello there and welcome back to Up My Hockey with Jason Padone for episode number 34. And today you are in for another treat. We have Todd Warner on the pod today. And Todd Warner, uh, for those of you who are of my age bracket, maybe in your 40s, maybe even 50s, even 30s, you would remember Todd because he was supposed to be the first overall pick back in 1992 NHL entry draft. He ended up going fourth to the Quebec Nordiques. We cover that story uh, of how that happened, which is really wild. And I had no idea uh, until he mentioned it. Uh, So we talk about that uh, being recognized as being potentially the top 18 year old in the world is an amazing uh, thing to consider. And Todd got to that spot from playing in a town of 5,000 people, uh, his minor hockey was B hockey. So that's like triple A, double A, single A, double B, single B, like the fifth level of hockey you could play. He did play up a couple levels. He play, played up uh, his his whole minor hockey, but it's just a, a wild story, an ascension from a small town, uh, getting to the Kitchener Rangers, uh, and then getting into the NHL as a fourth overall pick was super cool to hear. Uh, he also was a part of an amazing, huge blockbuster trade with uh, Matt Sundin coming to the Toronto Maple Leafs in exchange for Wendell Clark and some other pieces. We talk about that trade had major significance in the history of the Leafs. And to be a part of that, he'll always be remembered as being a part of that trade. But one of the interesting parts that we talked about was uh, Quebec's uh, choice to have him instead of playing junior for a fourth year, they suggested that maybe he consider playing for the Canadian national men's team in 1994. Uh, that national men's team uh, was supposed to go to the Lillehammer games uh, for the Olympics. And Todd chose to go that route. And what a wild ride that was for him. It was a bunch of young guys uh, trying to make a name for themselves, started the season not performing very well, uh, were really not supposed to meddle, not do anything. But through the course of the season, uh, they came together. Paul Carey was on that team as, a, as an 18-year-old rookie. Todd was one of the younger guys on that team as well. They ended up getting it all the way to the gold medal game. It's one of the great stories in Canadian men's Olympic hockey history. Uh, and we talk about that. I actually don't, quite honestly, give that the... You know, the rec- I, I don't ask the right questions in that segment, to be perfectly honest, because that was a massively huge thing in Canadian culture uh, for them to get to that game, for them to be up in that gold medal game. And that was the goal uh, for those of you that maybe remember or don't remember where Peter Forsberg put the one hand on his stick and put it in on his back and on Corey Hirsch in the shootout. So it was, uh, it was a big moment in hockey history, and Todd was a part of that. We do cover that. Um, one of the issues, though, with this whole story is that uh, Todd's internet ends up getting uh down the his battery on his ipad goes out so we have to cut the interview short we we do talk about uh, his nickname one touch which if you haven't heard how he got the nickname one touch uh, you need to listen to this episode just because of that it's one of the greatest stories uh nickname stories in the nhl that i've heard i love when he tells it uh brings a smile to my face every time uh, also, some great advice from Pat Burns that he shares when he was leaving training camp, thinking that he should have made the team that all you young players should hear and all you parents should hear. So lots of great stuff in this episode. Uh, unfortunately, because we got cut short, we didn't get to talk about Todd's time in Europe, uh, which was a big part of, of his uh, career at the end of his career. We didn't get to talk about Battle of the Blades, where he took up figure skating for a national television show here up in Canada. Uh, we didn't t- talk about his time anywhere else but Toronto. So I'm sure we'll have him back. Consider this part one of the Todd Warner interview series. And uh, without further ado, I bring you Mr. Todd Warner. (laughs) 
All righty. Here we are, 10 o'clock, live in the parent group, Up My Hockey. Uh, we're going to bring in Todd Warner here in a second. Uh, Todd and I go back to the Toronto organization years and years and years ago, and Todd uh, ended up playing a ton of hockey uh, in the NHL. He also went overseas, and now he's on TV uh, analyzing the game, so I felt he'd be a great guest for everybody. Uh, just a reminder here for all you guys that this is, uh, you know, a live recording of the podcast, which obviously has been uh, taking off. Uh, it's getting in a lot of people's uh, iPads and iPhones and everything else. And the fact that we can do this here live and you guys get to sit in with Todd and ask your questions, um, take advantage of it. You know, if there's anything that you hear, a uh, favorite player you maybe played with or a team or a question about a city or whatever, by all means, um, ask it, right? We all see it in the feed. If you are, if you have identified yourself, uh, I know StreamYard and and Facebook they they cooperate, but you do have to give them uh, the ability to show me your name. So if, if your name comes up, I'll definitely announce your name. I can even put the the, the question on the screen, and uh, and we can ask Todd. So by all means, participate in in the conversation. And uh, now, with saying that, I will bring in uh, Mr. Warner. Warnsy, what's going on, man? How are you, buddy? Good to see you. Can you hear me? Yeah, pleasure. yeah, I can hear you fine. You got me good. Got you. Yep. Good to be Wait, here. Where Where are you sitting right now? I'm sitting in my backyard in uh, Blenheim, Ontario. That's where I grew up and where my family and I moved back to. So, yeah, we've done some yard work in our in our COVID break, Jay. We got some uh, rock wall. I got a new tree house I built for the kids over here. I should probably take you for a walk. <laughs> and uh paint, painted our shed so we were kill we were making use good use of our time here on, on the home front i know right you and everybody uh else i think we did the exact same thing a lot of a lot of in-home projects and and everything yeah, else boy. so that was good we got some forest fires going on here right now so my yeah. my air my air doesn't look nearly as nice as your air <laughs> but, but uh, we'll yeah. leave it alone um I, I know you've 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 followed the podcast a little bit. You said you've seen some of the guests, and I have been fortunate yeah. to have some amazing guests. And kind of the idea here, uh, just to kind of brief you, is that I love getting into the past, uh, you know, telling your experiences to to the audience here, and maybe just not all the highlights either, right? Because we we know that hockey hockey's hard, you know, and and a lot of the people that are following this are either you know, aspiring young athletes, either their parents of athletes that want to get someplace or their coaches themselves are just hockey fans. And I like trying to shine the light in areas where it's like, it's not all roses and butterflies, you know, and not saying that, you know what, this is hard and you shouldn't do it, but just that, you know what, everyone has a story. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I would love to touch a few on those. And obviously I don't, I don't know everything about uh, your, your history, which is why I, I love doing what, what this is. So I'm sure I'll find out some things along the way, but um, you know, I, I, I want to start back in Windsor because that's where it kind of all starts. And actually, maybe we'll take one step back farther. You mean turning into where you ended up as a fourth overall draft pick there in 92. Was the writing on the wall for you? Did you feel like were you a minor hockey league uh, prodigy kind of guy or were you, or were you somebody that developed into your uh, potential? Well, I grew up playing in a small town and... I would say we had success. I wasn't really a prodigy. I mean, I played, I was lucky enough, I guess, Jay, I got to play up like in a small town, a town of like 5,000 people. I played a year ahead, sometimes two. So I was always, I was never the best player. You know, when I played with my age group, I guess I was one of the better players, but I was always sort of pushing myself just to make the team of guys a year and two ahead of me. So that was sort of my, my challenge as a minor hockey player. And we played what would be considered B hockey so triple a all the way down to b b double b b and that's what we played in my in my hometown growing up and i'm sure you're familiar with that out west too like so we were we had great coaches we had two coaches that came back from from u.s college to raise their families here who coached growing up and uh, who played uh, four-year scholarship guys tried out in professional hockey and so we had school teachers so they were you know obviously bright guys, good players, and in a small town, that doesn't happen every year. So we had them sort of exclusively from the time we were, you know, 10-year-olds to 15, 16-year-olds, and they helped us uh, a lot. And we had a group of players that were really good. We won half a dozen Ontario championships in the B level. So, but to say I was a prodigy, like, we didn't really know at that time, there's no internet. You know, you didn't really know what you're up against. I used to get the hockey news like every other kid, and, and, 
and there'd be a little clip on the GTHL on the back page. You know, that's all you, that's how you knew about Mike Pekka and I knew about Kevin Weeks and guys in our sort of age category. Like, but we didn't really know what we're up against. It wasn't until I was probably, you know, 15 that I played some summer hockey and could kind of, kind of compare yourself to, you know, the best in our province to start. And then, so that's kind of, uh, my background, um, yeah, re- really just a good group of kids that were real keen to learn, and we had great coaches, and once we had a couple of seasons at, you know, novice Adam where we did real well, then, you know, from year to year, you just you build on that. You have some success, and you want to keep keep doing it, right? So, sure. uh, so, so up until then, um, I just played, I played my minor hockey here, wasn't really sure where I fit in the whole scheme of things going into the Ontario hockey league. I watched it. As a, as a boy, because my dad's boss's son played for the Oshawa Generals, so that was sort of my connection to, to the OHL. I used to watch the OHL game of the week on Saturdays, and, and sometimes I would see him. His name was Lee Giffen. And so that was really my only connection to the OHL, was to see those games on Saturdays. And and uh, so to say I, I was sort of streamlined into that, I had no idea until I was 15, 16, and went to junior B camp that I could be a reasonably good player. You know? Right. Well, so in saying that, though, I mean, as, as a 15-year-old, you said you started to get on the radar. You mean at 16, you were in the OHL. I mean, how did yeah. how did that work? Was there a draft then, or how did you identify it by, uh, by Kitchener, and how did you end up there? Well, so I'm playing Bantam hockey here in our hometown, and we – we lose in the Ontario finals that particular year. And um, that would have been say April, the end of the season and mm-hmm. junior B rookie camp was about 10 days later. So we lost and I went to the junior B camp and uh, you know, call it May. And they invited me back to their main camp in Chatham, Chatham uh, Maroons. So I spent that summer thinking, oh, you know, it'd be nice to play some junior. Maybe I have to go back and play midget, play junior C. Junior C was a thing in my hometown. So mm-hmm. I went to camp really just for the experience. Like I had, I was, Jay, 5'10 and a buck 50. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like going into my junior beats. So I was skinny and I was just sort of at that time starting to work out. Like some of us from my Bantam team would go to the gym. And so it was all new. And I, so I went to camp. The coach was a guy who coached my father years and years ago in, um, uh, Wayne Jacklin in senior A hockey. So I think he sort of took a shine to me. My dad was around, obviously. And so I made it to the end of that camp. I made that team. That team was a Brian Wiseman team. I don't you know. You remember Brian? You would have played with Brian uh, in the minors. Yeah. So Brian was already set to go to Michigan then. And that was the year he broke the junior B scoring record on that Chatham team. So I'm a 15 year old playing with, you know, 19 year old like him. And and just take it all in, like really was surprised to be on the team, to be to be fair. And we had five other 16-year-olds who were all drafted into the OHL at the end of that year. So monster year, like 35 wins. We go to the Ontario semifinals. Brian sets the record. So everybody's following us at that time. And so that was sort of start of that year. I don't know if I was even considered for the draft. There's rankings that came out. Christmas I was in the middle of the draft and so as the year progressed and you drop out people start watching you more that's how I managed to get to the top of the draft and it was really just playing on a great team with a great coach and a guy that believed in me when I was just a little kid to be fair so what number did you end up going three you ended up going three wow so that that particular year uh uh fans will remember brad smith motor city smitty played for the leafs so he's a coach in windsor so he'd come the spits were out that year they didn't make the playoffs so we're playing for a month longer than them so i'm in chatham motor city's the coach of the spitfires and they pick third so he's come to all the games he's he knows wayne at this point because he's been to enough of our junior b games throughout the year that so i'm kind of his guy right so when the when the rankings came out that year Pat Peak was first. I was second. And then there was a guy named Jeff Bess, you remember from the minor, a really good player. And he played in um, St. Mary's. I played against him all year. So long story short, Hamilton picked second. And they were going to pass on me. They were going to take Bess. And so, of course, Smitty was, was thrilled that he was going to get me at three. So that's how it played out. I, I think that Brad had been to all, like, all my playoff games for about a month long and was really hoping that Hamilton would pass, and they did. And so I managed to go to Windsor. That's how it worked out. 
Super. I mean, you're so humble about that whole thing, though. Like, was it like, so you, you're you get to junior B, you legitimately don't think you might even make the team. And then you end up going third overall in the OHL draft. Like, that's There's a no- massive rocket ship ride that you went on that year. <laughs> well, that's, you know, today in today's world, it's hard for people to get their head around that, I think, because of the Internet. And, and you can you can you can go on some of these scouting services now, you know, and you can, you can look up the best 2007s, you know, it's like, well, I mean, they're still playing Pee Wee, you know? So, I mean, it's crazy to think that, but I really had, you know, we were pretty isolated. I was in a small town. Yeah. We had good teams and we were, we liked to win. And, and, um, but again, you know, the coach was a guy who knew my father. Do I even get an invite if it's not him? I don't know. Like, I don't know if I get an invite to camp, like, to be fair. And I'm around a bunch of these guys that were all year year older than me. Who some had played some junior already, and so I'm kind of you know I know these guys. I'm playing against them in minor hockey a little bit. Some of them from the area, and so and I'd always played up. So I they were kind of rivals of mine. So I kind of latched onto these guys. They were all you know had some junior experience, a year older than me, and and I I, I literally. If you'd asked me in, in August if there's any way I was going to be playing junior, I'd say there's no no way. I'm going to probably be playing midget. I need to get stronger. You know, junior hockey back then was pretty pretty rough, and well, I'm not sure my mom and dad really wanted me in junior to be fair. <laughs> you know, I was just a, I was just a little kid. I was a bantam. So yeah. Wayne Jack, when the coach took a chance on me, and and he did know our family, and and I wasn't sure I was ready out of the gate, but as the season went on and we did we did real well. I just got more and more confident. You know how it works. I just felt like I could play. And by Christmas, I was playing regular. And and then in the playoffs, uh, you know, I think I had 12 goals in 18 games or something. It's something ridiculous like that. So that just, you know, I went from the middle of the draft in the new year to the top of the draft. And it's just confidence, you know, and getting stronger. And I was going through puberty, to be honest, you know. And so I'm getting, you know, I'm growing and everything else and so uh it all just come together like that really i had no idea where i sat yeah. in the whole scheme of things so. well that's awesome and then the next year you end up in windsor and, and have an amazing campaign there again i mean 36 goals in 57 games hockey db says there i mean that's a heck of a year for any, <laughs> for any 16 year old right like was that yeah. was there because you'd played up the whole time you know even through your minor hockey was it just and you played junior b i mean i can relate to that because i played uh tier two with Paul Korea as a 15 year old. Right. So I was, I was playing with the, the Picton Panthers playing against those 21 year old guys that you were playing against. And you know, that's, that's a tough league, you know, and, and you, and you get exposed uh, to a lot of different things, toughness, you know, even the, the social side of that, which is, can be a big jump for guys. Right. You know I mean, fitting yeah. in with, with older guys. Uh, and then I went to Spokane and I think that really helped me my 16 year old year because I always, I already felt like I'd kind of done it almost a little bit, you know, could you, was that kind of how you felt going to Kitchener or was it a little different? Well, yeah, I would say that's true. I think my junior B year, you know, again, I was 15, you know, so you're playing, yeah, I was playing again with an older group. We had all these guys that had committed to college already a year in advance. So they kind of, some stayed back just to kind of see it through their last year of junior and, so they were they were good to me, but you know what it's like to be a you know that young on a team like that. So when I went to Windsor, yeah, I feel like I could. I was glad I had that year under my belt. Like a lot of the guys on our Windsor team the next year, they knew about our Chatham team because it was a bit of a story. You know, you know, you hear a story like Brian Wiseman, 148 points in 42 games. I mean that that travels even even in our small circle down here, right? So. So a lot of the guy, the veteran guys on our Spitfire team were aware of me and coming in and the team I played on and some of the players, they knew they knew some of the players too. So I think they just took to me. And, and if you know Brad, Motor City, you know, some of the some of the things that happened to young players weren't going to happen on Brad's watch. And that's what I love about Brad. He made sure that none of the hazing and all the some of the stories that we've heard from our era ever happened in Windsor when he was the boss. So that was part of his... Uh, you know, part of him being a tough guy, maybe Jay, and just looking after people, and that's sort of his role as a coach. He took pride in that, so he made it made it, you know, known right away that none of that was going to happen on uh, on the Windsor Spitfire. So they treated me great. The great players or older guys took to me, and and you know they needed us. I, I would say like Corey Stillman and I were the first two picks of that that season, and and Corey had a hundred points. You know, like a hundred points as a rookie. And he ran our power plays as a, as a rookie in the Ontario Hockey League. And the two, for me to come in with him, 
and a team that you know was picking third in the draft they needed our help and the, and the players knew it and so it was we were we were humble we were we were confident when we got to the rink and we got, got playing but by christmas or second half of the year they knew we were important to the team and and right. so they treated us like that which was good yeah which is interesting because i mean it, we, I've talked about opportunity lots in this podcast and, and opportunity is an interesting thing because sometimes you definitely need to earn it. And sometimes it kind of falls in your lap a little bit, you know, um, R- R- Wade Redden was a great guest for that. He's like, yeah, I got drafted by Ottawa and yeah, I was second overall, but they didn't have anybody. He's like, like yeah. I, I was, I was going to play as a 19 year old, whether I had a good camp or not. And if I made a mistake on that ice, I was probably going to go out there and get another chance to go do it again. He's like, that was a, that was really good for me because I, 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 I started to learn that I could play. Um, did you kind of feel that way a little bit? I mean, in, uh, in Kitchener with, you said, you know, maybe you didn't have that deep of a squad, you know, you're a high pick that you, you had an opportunity to, to maybe fail and know you'd get back out on the ice. For sure. Like again, going back to Brad, you know, he, I was his guy. I was his guy. So there was, you know, I think he recognized, you know, the team needed a bit of overhaul. I mean, this is in Windsor. This is a spitfire. So this is, you know, a team that picked third for a reason. Like they had a tough year the year prior. So, you know, Jason York was our captain. He was, he was great. I mean, he'd come from Kitchener where they had a winning pedigree before that. So he sort of, you know, he was one of the guys that sort of, took Corey and I under his wing and was like, we need these two young guys to help us turn the corner. And, and Brad, um, yeah, like I, I wasn't, you know, I was picked third. I, was I really ready? Like, I, I feel like when I went to that camp, I was still real, you know, you're still real nervous. You watched the OHL. It wasn't so easy to see where it, like today, like where you might fit in. And, and, uh, you know, I, I, I just, I, I would go watch Spitfire games from time to time when I was a kid. And it was just, in the old barn, it was just like chaos in there. Like it was just the fans and and the and the um the fighting and the it was just like rugby. And I thought, well, how am I gonna survive? And it's you know, and like really. Mm-hmm. And you know, once you get there, you're surrounded by these guys that you are the home team. So I always think like when I look back on it now, like the visiting team to come in the old Windsor Arena, you wouldn't know this maybe from being out west, but it was nuts. Like the, the fans would throw things and you had to fight your way out of the arena. This is old time hockey at its finest, and, but they were on our side. So I look at it now, like there was a lot of things that went on in my time in Windsor, like, and the, the, just the, the chaos of the crowd and the violence that went on that were scary, but they were on our side. They were on our side. If I, if I, when I came back as a visitor, it was a different experience for sure. So, so was I was I really ready? I don't know. Like I was still little, and I was 160 pounds, and and but Brad, you know, Brad took me under his wing. And he was my guy, and so he wasn't going to let me fail, you know. And and getting paired with Stilly, like, you know how good he is. Like he just, you know, in a small barn, you know, 180 by 75. Like it was, you know, just rugby. And I was skinny and small, and and he made me look like a player. And Brad was going to pedal us out there every other shift, so that was part of it too. Yeah, like we, on, on a lot of programs, maybe that's not the opportunity you get, but we did, and and uh, yeah. and we got Brad to thank for that. He was on our side. That's awesome. Did you ever experience that? I mean, there, I don't know how to put this for, from my experience side, but I, I never really felt like I had that guy as a pro, you know, like the coach that was like, Jay, you're my guy, you know, like, because they're, they're, every coach has a guy, you know what I mean? Like there's they, that happens sure. at, at every level, whether it's NHL or AHL, there's a group of guys that the coach kind of is fond of. Like, did you ever f- find that you had that again at the pro level? <laughs> Well, I don't know if I had any coaches, Jay, that were on my side like that, but I always talk about Cliff Letcher, and you know, like, like I don't know what it was with Cliff. Like, I, I've seen Cliff in the last, you know, year, and I always speak to him and say my thank yous because he traded for me three times. And it's probably the reason he's not working regularly in the league anymore, but <laughs> but, but he traded for me three times. So, I, you know, I come to, in the big trade to Toronto, obviously, um, uh, with, with, with Matt. Uh, you know what it's a huge day in my life as you can imagine and then later he trades for me in tampa and then he trades for me in phoenix again so i mean like without cliff you know in my court i'm not sure i play as long as i do as you could probably understand so yeah and for every player like me that has a guy there's five that don't 
and that could probably have a career like I had, you know what I mean? And you know that from playing at both levels. So, so I said, when I got to Europe later and, and I, you know, we'd go play, a, a, you know, Czech league team or we'd go play a, you know, a Russian league team or, every, you know, for every player you knew that came from Slovakia or the Czech Republic or Russia, there were three that stayed home that were just as good. And, you know, so you're playing against players you'd never heard of and you're, you're, it's an eye opener how good they really are in, in pro hockey yeah. all over the world. So, and now it's even, it's tenfold again, like the quality of players everywhere. So, so to have Cliff, you know, he would be my guy. He wasn't a coach, yeah. but uh, as you know, when you, you trade for a guy three times, uh, whatever it was, he saw in me, he, he kept seeing it. <laughs> right. No, that's wild. I, I didn't, yeah. I didn't realize that we had that, uh, that connection because Cliff was who traded for me, right. Out yeah, of no, I know. And, he, and he was also the guy that wanted to draft me in 94 and it was kind of a crazy draft story where he, he, it was just me and him in, in the room, like for my draft day interview with Toronto, there was no other scout there nothing. And he told me, oh, yeah. He gonna, yeah, he said, I'm going to take you tomorrow, Jason, you're going to be a Toronto Maple Leaf with their first pick. He, uh, oh. he told me, he told me that they were going to trade up for me to get me like they, he kind of like got into the weeds. He's like, yeah, we take pick 18. We're going to trade up. Um, see you at the draft day table tomorrow. Like it was the um, most unbelievable draft interview that I had. And who did they take? And who who was it they, they took? took Fisho. So oh, they ended up right. taking yeah, Fisho. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and then uh, and I guess one of the one of the pro scouts there for them. I think their head guy uh, passed away from a heart attack like a couple of days before the draft. And and that he came like Cliff came to me afterwards and said, "Hey, I really apologize. We we had a change of heart almost because of uh, you know the emotional side of what happened, right? Like that." The, the pro scouts guy Dorian uh, was his guy was Fisho. So they, they decided to, you know, whatever that, that decision was, but it was like kind right. of in the moment on the day. And, uh, and he said, sorry. And then like two years later, he ended up trading for me. And then as you just said, it's amazing, right? Because that new GM comes in Mike Smith. And like, I was not on that radar at all, <laughs> you know, like, That's right. That's how it happens. Leaves and it's like, it doesn't matter what you do. You just can't get a shot. So it's well, nice. I got, to a, story. Someone, I got you know? a story like that too, Jay. Sorry. I got a story like that too. So when my, in my draft year, I don't know if you know this. Uh, so I was at, I was ranked first in the NHL draft, if you could imagine. So <laughs> <laughs> My, so my particular year, it's Tampa's, uh, the first year of Tampa Bay's franchise. So Phil Esposito and Tony are the guys that are sort of in charge and the, the figureheads at the very least GM, but uh, Phil was uh, for the new franchise. So so our season ends in Windsor. Um, we lost in the first, second round that year, I guess it was. So I, you know, I'd interviewed with half a dozen teams throughout the year. Like, you know, the scout comes to town, takes you to lunch, gives you, tells you about the program, whatever. We're, we're, you know, it's nice to meet you. We'll see what happens come, come June, whatever. So it's, it's probably the middle of May and Tampa brings a, a bunch of the top prospects down. Brandon Connery was one of the players. Mike Rathje was one of the players. Um, down to Tampa, three days, interviews, we go golfing, we hang out with Phil, we just kind of get the, the lay of the land, all the things they're doing for this new franchise. So I get home the next week, and Phil calls me at the house. Okay, so keep in mind, I'm, I'm the top-ranked prospect. There's Hammerlick, there's Kasparaitis, there's uh, Ratchy players like this all in the, in the top, Stillman. And he says, you're our guy. Phil, Phil Esposito. So you imagine you're sitting at home with your parents in the late May, and I'm, I'm, I'm a month from the draft, but I know I'm going first. But you can't say anything. You know, so it's like, okay, I appreciate that. You know, I'm excited. Uh, I'll keep that under, under wraps, and I'll uh, sit here in my, in my home for the next month until we go to the draft in Montreal. Well, draft comes. Donnie Meehan, of course, is my agent. You know that. And so Donnie says, meet me in Toronto. Take the train. We'll get you a suit, and you can ride with me to, to, to Montreal in my car. I'm from Montreal. Donnie, I don't know if you know, Donnie's from Montreal. We'll go down on Wednesday. Okay, that sounds awesome. You know? So we get in Donnie's car, stop and buy a suit. Ro Harry Rosen, first time I've ever been in downtown Toronto. <laughs> and so we drive down. Donnie, I, I get a room at the Queen Elizabeth Hotel downtown Montreal. So Donnie, of course, is showing me McGill University. He takes me down to the old part of Montreal. He's showing me around the place and I'm like, oh, this is great. So my family, um, my immediate family and my close close friends, there's about a 60, 70 group, group of people that are all driving down Thursday. They check in Thursday night. Thursday night's a write-off, as you can imagine. And then Friday, Donnie calls me in my room. It's about 5 o'clock. 
So we're getting ready to go back down on St. Catherine Street. All my buddies, family, have dinner and then go after it. You know how it would be. And Donnie says, come to my room. I got to talk to you. And this is, he's in a floor above at the Queen Elizabeth. He says, hey, um, brings me into this room. Says, I just got off the phone with uh, Phil Esposito. He says, um, they had meetings yesterday. Uh, their new staff. So, you know, at that time it would be like scouts. There, there's not really player development, but there's, you know, hockey ops people and, and, and that are new, all new to a new brand new franchise. Yeah. So we had, they had meetings and they decided to let their scouting staff and, and hockey ops people decide on the first pick. So it's not really Phil's call anymore. Esposito's call anymore. And they're going to take Hammerlick, Roman Hammerlick, which clearly was a good choice on their part. So, so I'm sitting with my aces, you know, 24 hours, not even 18 hours before the draft. He doesn't know where I'm going. Now, so for six weeks, I've been sitting on this news that Tampa's taking me first. I've done no interviews, right? So I, 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 I met with San Jose in January. They picked third. So Donnie says, we might be able to get you to Toronto at six. And I'm thinking to myself, Jesus, that's, that's a pretty big slide, right? Like, so, so anyway, I, so he, he doesn't know what's going to happen. So this is a true story. I tell this story once in a while because I love Donnie and Donnie likes to hear that I tell this story too. So we're sitting on the floor of the draft. We're row five, Montreal Forum, and the draft starts. So hockey circles, people have heard I'm I'm one. So Phil goes to the podium and they take Hamlet. And everybody kind of, you can see there's the people people behind me in my, my immediate fa- uh, peer group, family and friends were like, what the hell happened there? You could hear this sort of collective groan in the forum. And so then Ottawa takes Yashin. Pretty good pick. Not going to lie to you. And then Rathji goes to San Jose. So now I'm sitting there and, and pick after pick, everybody in the, in the whole area is like, what, what the hell is going on with Warner? So Donnie's sitting here beside me pat morris you know the newport crew and then my mom and dad my sister are beside me to my left and i'll never forget it donnie's looking down at the draft floor and there's pierre gauthier and pierre page they kind of they kind of just get up from the table with the jersey tucked under their arm and they look over at donnie like you're our guy we're taking your guy donnie Meehan. so they're nodding at donnie Meehan in the crowd from the draft floor and donnie goes oh shit Quebec's going to take it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> right? That's what he says. So I'm thinking to myself, well, I guess I got to pretend like I'm really thrilled about this. This is my agent, right? So given what's happened with Quebec to that point, the whole Lindros thing, just the dollar, the tax, you know, everything that was associated with Marcelo Boo and we've come to learn, Donnie knew. And so he's like, damn, I can't, I can't, can you please pass so I can get him to Toronto? That's when he's secretly hoping yeah. they don't pass. So they, they draft me. And so I don't, you won't remember, but I walked down to the forum and I'm, you know, putting on a brave face. Like I'm, you know, I'm, I, I am thrilled to get picked. I'm not, I'm not that kid. You know that. So I don't really care where it goes, but when your agent says that to you, you know, you hug your mom and dad and you go through the motions like you should. And, and you walk down there, you do your interview, whatever. So you'll remember the year prior Lindros got picked, tucked the Jersey under his arm, walked off the stage. Right. The Nordique jersey didn't want to put it on. So I come down, walk up on stage, grab the jersey, put it on, pull the hat over my head. And the crowd stands at the Montreal Forum and cheer because I put on the Quebec Nordique jersey. I don't know if you remember this, but and at that moment, it sort of dawns on me like this is why they're cheering because I'm the first person to actually put this sweater on right. when, when, when in the first round. So anyway, I have a similar story. It's a similar story too. Like I was. I was set to go right up until the 12th hour, like literally. And Donnie says, I don't know what's happening now. So I had to sit there back to everybody I knew and pretend like I didn't know the news like everybody right. else. But I did, but I did, but really it was like, it was a bit of a nerve wracking experience. Cause once you don't, once you know, you're not going to be that guy. My agent had no idea where I was going to end up. So, well, and then it's also it's I would assume it'd be a bit nerve wracking even for the other NHL teams, because like you said, everyone probably kind of knew or thought they knew. And now all of a sudden at the last minute, your name is now available. Now they're like, what happened? Why is it available? Maybe even right. Like, yeah, I mean, I don't know what to say about like, I know, 
like I hadn't really talked to anybody. That's the thing. Like I, I would say like, you know, now you go and you, you do the car wash, you know, you go sit in a, a, a room and the teams come to you when you're a first rounder, like they got to oh, yeah. run the gauntlet, you got to run the gauntlet for a full day of interviews and they do the psych tests and all the, like I, I had lunch with about four scouts. That's about what it that was the extent of my, uh, you know, draft interview. Right. So, so I had no, you know, I had no concept of where I was going to go. And I, I, I couldn't even have told you who was running Ottawa or San Jose at that time. Like, I had no idea. And so I'm sitting there with my agent, and he gets a nod from the table, and I'll never forget. So Donnie, me, and you know Donnie, one of the one of the south of the earth people you ever meet in the game. Never do never do wrong by you. And he says, oh, shit. Because you know, <laughs> <laughs> he knows what we're in for. So sure yeah. enough, I go, to camp, I go to camp that year, and I, I – pretty much make the team out of camp and i and it's october 1st we start so it's a monday night i gotta be signed by midnight and the the season starts wednesday right i don't know if you remember how this all played out so i made, went to the end of end of camp i scored a bunch of goals in camp i was playing okay i wasn't sure i was really ready same as when i was in windsor or same as in junior i wasn't sure i was really ready they're putting in the new rule changes less obstruction so it was the fastest skating i'd ever done in my life go right to the end of camp and we get a contract offer at like dinner time. I got six hours to basically sign it, right? And it's mm -hmm. Canadian dollars. It's an extra year at this time. I don't remember. So Kasparaitis and Yash and all these players that were picked around me, Stillman were all signed before they went to camp. I go to camp without a deal and play right through the end, risk injury. Like you imagine that now, that would never happen. Yeah. And then, I, and then it's the, you know, it's six hours left and I, I get this deal faxed to Donnie's office in Toronto. And he's like, you're not signing this. I got, I got your plane ticket. You leave tomorrow morning. So I never actually was ever cut from my first training camp in the NHL. My agent got me a ticket and sent me home as a negotiating ploy, if you can imagine. So I, you know, this is, this all happens pretty fast. When you're that age, you're not really re ready to deal with all that either. Right. Yeah. So I was just trying to make the team and do whatever I could. And, and so then that's what Donnie knew was coming at the draft that day. It was, dealing with Quebec, right? So. Yeah, and it, was that the issue over the summer too? Like, were you guys trying to get something done over the summer and you just couldn't agree? Yeah, I mean, yeah, there was talk right after the draft. I mean, I spent most of a week there right after the June draft. And then, you know yeah, how that works. They bring you into town and, and you meet everybody and, and you go through the motions that way. And so there was, yeah, really that was the way it should have been. You know, given that there were six or seven of the guys from the first round that were already signed, and you know, U.S. dollars, the tax issues, my 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 term was a year longer than everybody else's. This is what they offered me, and I had already gone through a training camp, so I couldn't. So he, Donnie's like, "No, I want you to be in camp. It'll be a show of good faith, as you can probably you've probably heard that term many times." So I did. I was happy to do it. I mean, it wasn't really at that point. You're not thinking about the money and the deal. You just want to see how you size up, right, in the NHL. And so that's what I was doing. And, and, um, but when it came time to really step up, they didn't. And so that was part of the reason I was traded later. Gotcha. And so when you leave there, then you could have signed and come back, right? Like, cause just cause you were still junior eligibility, everything else. Right. But was it kind of then a little bit of, there was some sour people there involved in, in Quebec. And was that, was the contract negotiation kind of left alone at that point? Well, I'll say this. It wasn't, it was out of the hands of the staff. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't Pierre Paget's call as a head coach. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't Pierre Gauthier's call as a, as a GM. Like they, so what ha what had happened was, you know, I find out at dinner time on the, on the Monday, I need to be signed by midnight. The next morning I have a flight and Pierre called me Paget at my uh, apartment, at my uh, hotel room and said, come down to the rink. I want to see you before you go. So he felt terrible about it, to be fair. And so did Pierre Gauthier. And it was out of there. It's, it's just a money issue through, about the owner, really. And it wasn't like I was asking Lindros money. You know how it worked. Like, I was just trying to get, you know. And I thought that I'd gone through, you know, six weeks of camp and really done done my part in the deal. Like, I was part of it. I, I'm, I'm not under contract. Insurance policy through the roof. Just to go. You know? and yeah. So, anyway, Pierre was, was upset to learn the news because it was out of his hands both peers and and wished me well and said i hope it works out no hard feelings whatever and i went back on my own had my own flight home went back to junior so not right. the story you hear very often today but that's how it played out yeah
Yeah. I mean, you had a great junior career there. I mean, go, going back to when you were first getting involved and maybe you have one in the NHL as well, but was there a moment in time where there was, you know, where you knew that you arrived or there's this kind of this moment where either you had to fight somebody or you got hit or whatever the case may be that was like, all right, you're in the respect of your teammates and even maybe of yourself to believe that you're in the right spot? You know, I think I would say it was my draft year. Um, you know, after my rookie year, you know, you're so young. There's a big turnover with our team in Windsor. So I'm coming back, you know, I'm sort of on the radar now, under 18 player for Canada. And I come back and I hurt my knee. So it was right around Christmas. I hurt my knee. I was sort of, you know, preliminary talk to maybe go to the world junior tryouts that put a halt to that quickly. It was the end of January when I finally come back. And so I miss 15 games roughly. And that was when I, I thought, well, this is, I'm going to have to finish strong here. Or I'm in trouble. Like, right. So I had a great start. I was at a goal a game clip in a November, if you can imagine. So I was, and it's my draft year. So I'm thinking this is the start I wanted. And then I get hurt. So that was really the, really my test was like, how quickly can I come back from this? I have to really, I just remember thinking I'm going to, focus on my rehab and I want this, I want the end to be as good of a start. And so that would probably be when I look back on that second season, my draft year was finishing strong and, and letting everyone know that I was all right. Hey there, everybody. Just going to take a quick break from the podcast here to ask you to stop what you're doing right now. Press pause. I know the vast majority of you who listen to this show, listen to it on an Apple device, which means you get it from Apple Music, which means that you can review the podcast and means that you can rate the podcast. So do that. It takes legitimately no time at all. If this is your first podcast, I understand. Maybe just hold off, leave your judgment for now, see if you like it. But if you've listened to more than one of these things and you're enjoying it and you are having it be part of your week, I would really appreciate it if you press pause and if you took the time to write a review. You don't have to write a review, actually. Just put five stars. Uh, if you take the time to write a review, even better. But it really helps. And I know that there's a ton of you guys listening, and I'm super thankful for it. Uh, and I know it's one extra step in your day uh, to uh, to help out the pod. But please do. It makes a big difference uh, for the podcast. It makes a big difference for other people being able to hear it. So you Apple users out there, stop what you're doing. And, uh, and I'd love to be able to read one of the, one of the reviews uh, on the next episode. So thanks again for listening. Appreciate all the support. Appreciate all your listeners. Uh, do your part to help me out. And uh, back to the podcast. And how'd you go about doing that? Obviously, you have to work hard in the gym, get that knee back. But how how was it? A lot of guys have a hard time coming back from injury. I mean, at any age, because there's some doubt, you know, there's some uncertainty. Like, how did you handle that from a mindset side? Well, I remember being at rehab and just sort of sweating that exact feeling, like just saying, "What, well, geez, you know, like there's because all of a sudden you're like, you're like a first rounder. And is this now, you know, mean you the end of your career like you know you're young I was still young and I'm t sort of sorting out how how this uh, affects what's going to happen at the end of the year and then in June and then am I going to be you know, how do the scouts and teams see this sort of injury this at this time right so so my rehab was done at the university or at the Windsor hospital and I would go religiously I remember that was the first time Jay like I really started to ride the bike with a purpose. Like I, I not just taking your road bike out and going for a twirl in the summer or whatever. Like I was going to the gym and, and, and working out and like, you know, warming up on the bike, doing all my rehab with all the, all the modalities and working on my strength. And I just remember, you know, the conversation with our therapist, I'm trying to remember his name. Sorry, but I, just in saying like, you know, I need to this thing to fast track. And he's like, you, there's no way, around the protocols for this. You have to take the time to do this properly. This is a ligament tear and, and, and you need to, you know, focus on what you can at this point and next week we'll do this. And so kind of late, he, he sort of like talked me off the ledge and was like, this is what we need to focus on. So, 
just take it easy. And cause I was, uh, it was a rush job for me at that point. Like I was like, you know, processing all the things that could go wrong. Yeah. And, uh, so yeah, that, that would have been the point where I realized, you know, the work I needed to put into it and then just, uh, you know, making sure the, str- the, the, the end of the season was a good one. Yeah. And it was, I mean, what a great draft year. I can see why you were, why you were touted so high. That's pretty wild. With that whole Tampa Bay thing. That's nuts. Cause yeah. That you fact, I mean, I remember when I was there, I mean, that was only two years later too. My draft year was 94. You were 92. And, yeah. uh, at the draft, my draft was in, in Hartford and like, that's where all, I mean, you did a lot of stuff pre-draft, right? Where teams would fly you out. But then at the draft, you like, there was like a lineup, like you said, like we wouldn't stay in one spot. We'd go to different hotels or go whatever. And we'd meet all these teams. And I remember meeting almost all the teams in that, uh, right. in that, in that day, day or two lead up. And it's interesting. You didn't even have a chance to, to do any of that. Cause they are yeah. all thought that you were taken, getting taken by Tampa. That's nuts. That's so with that whole contract dispute then, or I mean, if you want to call it a dispute, you went back to junior, yeah. have another good junior year. And then you end up going to the Canadian national team. Like, did you ever sign an NHL contract with Quebec or, or like, yeah, what was so, so what happened was I, <laughs> I went back to Windsor that next year and we'd already traded Corey Stillman to Peterborough, which was a huge move. So he basically in the off season asked for a trade out of Windsor. He's moved to Peterborough before he goes to NHL camp at Calgary. So he knows he's going back to Peterborough if he gets cut. So I go back to a Windsor team that struggles. And that's so, you know, and so we, I think it was, gosh, it was when I went to world junior, you know, December 15th, we got our sixth win the day before of the season. You know what I mean? So that's kind of yearly. We're like six and 16 or something, you know, and, I, and I'm leaving for world junior. So I get traded, I get cut from world junior and I get traded to Kitchener while I'm at world junior camp. And that was sort of, you know, getting traded to a better team and playing in the playoffs. That was sort of how uh, the contract ultimately got worked out because I was playing in a, in a better situation. Getting cut from World Junior didn't help because I didn't sign until it was March. I was in Kitchener and we were going into playoffs kind of thing. So, um, yeah, it took some time. It took some time. Donnie wasn't, you know, Don, I said, you know, Donnie did whatever he could to help me at that point. And he was like sort of keeping me up to speed with how it was going, but there was nothing happening. You know, I was going, I went back to a Windsor team. It was, wasn't nearly as competitive. And then I get cut from world junior. So for his, from his standpoint, I didn't, he didn't have a lot of leverage at this point. So it wasn't until I got to Kitchener played pretty well and, and uh, was actually leading the playoffs and scoring at one point that uh, it all got worked out. You know, how that yeah, goes. I saw that too. 19 points in seven games. That's not a bad playoff run there, um, to say the least. But I'm super curious about the Canadian national team. Like, so yeah, you sure. end up signing the NHL deal. I, you go to camp again, I assume, for a second year with, with Quebec and, and, I, and what transpired there. I do. I go back to camp my second year. And uh, that, that particular camp, they'd, uh, you know, made the Lindros trade. So they're getting all these players now from Philly. And the team was much better. And I, I'm actually, you know, I talked about how I thought I played well enough in my rookie training camp to maybe make the team. I was there to the 11th hour, but this time around, I'm not sure uh, they were had plans to keep me anyway. So I don't, whether it was part of the deal, I, I, there was no hard feelings between Pierre and, and, uh, and myself. It was mostly an ownership thing and just, just dollars that were, you know, got in the way of it in my first camp. So second camp was much more competitive and we got to the end of camp and, um, Pierre Paget, Pierre Gauthier, they called myself and Dwayne Norris. And it was, again, it was like the Monday before the Wednesday season started. So we're the last two cuts. And they're like, guys, you know, Dwayne had already scored 35 in the minors year before in Halifax. And so he was, I think, ho- hoping to start his, the year in the NHL. Good little player, Michigan State. Um, so he says, would you like to shot the national team? Like Tom Rennie's called us and said, well, you know, we, we need some players. And what do you think? So that's, that's how it came. They, the, Quebec brought that to us. And at the time it was like, it's like, you know, when you go back with your fourth, it's, it's a big story now in hockey, the fourth year of junior for these high sort of profile players, like a Mitch Marner went back or Dylan Strom went back and played a fourth season after already having a hundred points or whatever. It's, is it really in their best interest for development? You know? So for me at that time, that was a, that was a really good opportunity to kind of play against men. You go, we traveled all over, you don't, you don't play a home game, travel all over the world got to see the world uh we trained out of calgary it was in sort of three week blocks times three throughout the year and the rest of the time you're on the road playing games and 
And um, so I loved it. And, you know, we went right through to the, you know, gold medal game of the, of the Olympic games in Lillehammer and our team, when we first got together, I tell this story every year, I get to put on my Olympic coat and pedal my medal around in an Olympic year and talk to schools and kids. And, and it's basically that we were, we were a motley crew. We, we, we didn't know how to win. We didn't know how to prepare. We didn't know a lot of things. A lot of us, we were all 20 to 24 years old and you know, you have to learn how to be a pro. And, and, um, so we trained, we, we learned from sports psychologists, uh, sports physiologists. We had all the best people helping us. And we went from a team that I said, at Christmas, we played the Americans eight times. We hadn't won one time. And so people were kind of dragging us through the mud. We'd gone to the Izvestia tournament. We lost to France. And so it was sort of this public outcry that we needed to revamp the whole team and and I always tell the story of Cal Botterill, um, Jason, uh, Jason's dad, who was our sports psychologist. And he used to meet with us every couple of weeks and just sort of like say, you know, what's ever happened in October or November is in the rear view. You have to th- start thinking about February. What can you do in the next six, eight, 12 weeks to, to best give yourself a chance? And so, I mean, literally that whole team, we were supposed to meet this spring for a reunion, Jay. And it got got snubbed out. And Tom Rennie was on board. Paul Curry was coming from California. He was going to be a weekend up in Collingwood. And so we were all pumped to, to see, have that happen. And we'll do it again at some point. But, you know, I tell people that that team at Christmas was in such disarray that there was no chance that we anybody considered us for a medal. And really, we just, in about a six-week window, started to really start to play well. We we went to, we won a bronze, I think it was, at the um, Globin in Stockholm about three weeks before the Olympics. And then we just got on a roll. That's how it happens. You know, like, you catch fire, confidence starts to go, players believe in each other, the coach is not as annoying anymore. All the things that you, you need to have happen just happened right there in February for us. And, man, it was incredible. And, uh you know, some of those guys went on to have good careers. You know, there's Brian, Paul, as we mentioned, and Brian Savage and Adrian O'Coin. There were some good players on the team. Manny Legacy, Corey Hirsch. But there was a lot of guys who, that was it. That was it. There's a national team at that time, you remember. There was guys at the, the lower end, the younger end, who were embarking on something. And then there was guys just trying to hang on. And um, so I look back on that team, you know, as one of the ones I'm most proud of. Because we were, weren't very good in the fall and yeah. in about a you know six or eight week window we got our act together and and look what happens you know look what's gonna happen yeah that's really wild i i was i was chuckling to myself because i looked at that team and obviously you know the paul korea stands out i think he was 18 at the time and i mean i'm sure that was part of the whole growth of that team too is that you just had you had some young guys i mean you just got to figure out how to play on that big ice how to play together how to feel that you belong and and all that stuff and i'm sure um, you know, you guys were all going through that a little bit, but uh, a little trivia question for you. Who do you think led that team in goals uh, as far as according to Hockey DB goes? Who led our team in goals? That would be Lushko. Yeah. Carl Lushko. <laughs> I was dying when I saw that. I mean, I, I played with Lush in uh, Germany and I, I know you know him well. And he's I love a, that guy. guy. I love that guy. I, I want him to be a future guest on the, on this program too, but I was, uh, that's a pretty good claim to fame for Lush there to, to lead that Lush, team in goals. Lush, cool. yeah. Lush could score. Lush had a heavy shot. He was a bit, you know, he was, uh, I would say he was a grinder. He was a runner out there, but he played hard. And you don't know this, but I there, I have a picture in my house of Lush. I'm on the ice with Lush. So Lush's dad had died. It's a, it's a, it's a terrible story. And he promised his dad a medal. So we're playing the whole next year. His dad had died a year, year before. And we're, and so I live with Lush, Adrian O'Coin, Lush, Brian Savage, Dwayne Norris. We're all in a house Calgary and me and, you know, keep in mind we're in Calgary for again like three weeks, and then we went to the Deutschland, and three weeks, and we go to the Vestia. Three weeks we're in Europe for the to the end of the year, so we weren't really there very much. But we lived together, and we go we grew pretty close, all of us. So we still talk today, all of that whole crew of guys. And um, and Lush's dad was was dying, and Lush said, "Dad, I'm going to win you a medal, the Olympics, right? So, and a gold medal." at the Olympics, right? So we spend the whole year and this story sort of, it's out. Lush doesn't talk about it, but we know what, what's at stake. And man, does this guy play? I don't know if you saw the, remember the Olympic games at that point, but he was our best player and he's hammering guys and he's scoring goals. And so I get hurt in 
No, it was like the fourth game. We're playing Slovakia. I, I roll my ankle and I'm on crutches. So the, for the lot for the gold medal game, so we we go through quarterfinals, semi, we make it to the final game. Tom Rennie, myself, and Mark Astley are hurt. Tom says, "If I want you to have your gear on, come 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 sit on the bench for the game. I know you can't play, but I want you on our bench. And you know, in Europe, you can have extra bodies. <coughs> Excuse me. So I'm on the bench for the gold medal game, dressed." Full regalia, can't not no, I'm not playing. So I'm like the best cheerleader, like I'm gonna be right. So we lose that game, and I can see Luce is devastated, right? So I have a picture in my house of me hugging Luce on the ice and just saying, Hey, bud, like your dad would be proud of you, you know what I mean? So great guy, he's he's in Jamal with Mannheim now. I don't know if you know, but I talk to him all the time. I really what's, like he do, what's he doing with Manheim? He's like a, he's like their correspondent here in North America. He he does recruiting. Uh, he travels around and watches like American League and NHL games, and he 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 plucks players for him. He does a good right. job. Yeah, no, I did yeah. uh, I did know that actually. Yeah, what a wild story, man! Thanks yeah. for sharing that. That's nuts. Yeah. I'd love to watch some old tape of that because um, <laughs> you know, yeah, I, you know, we're, we're as when you're playing, it's tough to watch other guys play and playing and what they're up to, right? But. Uh, that's that's crazy that you got to spend that time with Lush and, and that crew. And isn't that a wild too? Like success like that, like just brings guys together, you know, like, cause you've gone through that stuff and you have the success and now you're still talking to those guys. I'm sure there's a lot of teams you played on where there might've been good guys in that team and you guys got along, but you just, you know, those relationships just aren't as strong. Well, I think part of it, and I don't know how you feel, but like I played on, you know, I played on some good teams who kind of went about their business and, and, and were expected to maybe win and whatever, but it's, it's the teams that, you know, really had to get, get it. Like, I, I feel like there was seasons I started that, man, it didn't look good for us. And, and when it's unexpected too, you kind of arrive at it, you know, organically and you have to soul search and you have to deal with some problems when you really get to know who you're playing with. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And as a coach now, that's part of, part of um, you know, you talk about adversity. People talk about adversity. What is adversity? Well, when you're playing for your country and you got to read about yourself in the paper, they want to, you know, they're, they're folding up and, and, and throwing you under the bus from November on. Well, we didn't know how to deal with that. We're all little kids, you know, we're all like, you know, 20 or 20 years old. We were, so that was, that was heavy. That was heavy, mm-hmm. you know? And then when you find a way to get through all that and you really, you know, let people know who you are, then it feels better when you find yeah. a way to win. Like, I, I feel like that's the case too, you know, but teams that were expected to maybe do well, that's, it's, um, it's harder to fall through on that. I think it's harder to, you know, you don't maybe deal with as much adversity. It's, there's some expectation that gets in the way of some of that. So mm-hmm. I feel like that group of guys were young enough that, and it was the first time probably any of them or a lot of them had ever dealt with that kind of pressure. And to yeah. get through it and, and find a way, you don't forget that. You know? Did you um, did you think Paul was as, as special then as he turned out to oh. be? Like, was it writing on the wall? Yeah, you know, to be, to be completely honest, you know, when Paul came to us, he had such a, he was such, such a focused, you know, athlete. Like, I, I remember thinking a lot of us that are older than him, we need to be paying attention to what this kid's doing because he's really sharp. He trains hard. He eats right. And the whole mental side of it. And I can remember, this is how I came to know about it. We're in a, one of these, you know, um, sports psychology talks with Cal Bottle. And Cal um, had been the, the guy that would weigh in with the national team. He worked with the Calgary Flames at one point. And um, I used to say, when I saw Jen, I'd say, um, I, I want to, I want you to tell the story about your dad. He used to work with our team and I want you to know like the impact he had on our team. And we're sitting around a conference room, I don't know, on the road somewhere. And Cal says, Paul, can you just tell us if, if it's okay, what you think about the day of a game? You know, like, what do you think about the day of the game? So Paul, you know, this is like visualization at its, you know, infancy, for you and I, like I, I, I would lay down at night and picture myself scoring goals and doing things, whatever, but Paul would take it to a different level. He would say to the trainer, like, which jerseys are we wearing tonight? Which bench are we going to be on? You know, like, uh, how many people are paid to come tonight? Uh, is there a ban? You know, what, like all he wanted to know, he wanted to have not just, not just about you fixing yourself on the ice. We all visualize whether we know we did it or not. All wanted to have the whole image 
fresh in his mind when he laid down at his nap in the afternoon. And I thought, wow, that's, that's impressive. Like he, he would, he would find out whatever he could about the picture in the building and the colors and the everything he could, who's refereeing, you know, he wanted to know all that. So call, I remember Cal calling him and just saying, Hey, uh, tell him what you do, tell him how you see it. You know, and that was, that was the start. You know, I remember thinking, wow, I sh- I'm way behind. Right. <laughs> But it was, uh, yeah, he was just so, so in tune with what he needed to do. And, and really, when you look back on it, having him there was good for all of us, especially some of the older guys who never considered some of those things in the training and the way he, the way he uh, looked after himself. So, and plus, he was a hell of a player, as you know. So Yeah, massive amount of skill. And what I found in really interesting and intriguing with him and something that I that I couldn't relate to is that he didn't give a rip about what anyone thought of him, you know, because like that aspect, like you said, I mean, like he had older guys looking down going, what's this guy all about, you know, and it helps that he was amazing, but he wasn't doing what everyone else was doing. And even like socially, right, he wasn't doing what everyone else was doing. He showed up at different times. He'd leave at different times. All that stuff was like he was so uber focused on what he wanted to do and what he wanted to become. Like, I really found that admirable now looking back at 44 years old, because that's hard to like stand apart and be OK with not fitting in. Yeah, he was an independent thinker. And, and I, you know, a lot of people at that time, when you were that way, I think, you know, would rub people the wrong way. But at the root of it was a focus and, and a hard work that you couldn't deny, mm-hmm. you know, when it came to practice, Paul was early. He'd be shooting pucks. He stayed late. He skated as fast as anybody. He worked as hard. He'd get on the bike. He would pedal. Remember how he used to pedal the bike, pedal the bike is like 140 Watts or RPMs. Like he pedal it so fast. And you're like, wow. Like he just did everything efficient and, and to the nth degree that you couldn't deny he was determined, you know? And so if, yeah, if maybe he, he didn't agree with me, you know, you slept or you ate or you, whatever happened, you know, like this is just who he was. And he, and you're right. He was like, you were just getting on a fast moving train. Paul was going, if you're going to come with him, you better get on. Right. Yeah. And that's okay. That's okay. And look what, it, look what he ended up doing. And, and he's still that way. You know, he's still um, a bit of a loner in that respect, I think. And cause he, I think he probably felt like he was on his own in some of his thinking, but some of his thinking was way ahead as we now know too. Oh, hundred percent. I mean, everything I said there was complimentary to him. I mean, I was super complimentary. I think he was ahead of his time. And, uh, and I'm just trying to shine a light on the fact that it's, it's hard to be ahead of your time, especially in a, in a peer group sport, right. Where you're part of a team and for him to be that resilient and resolute about what he knew was right. Um, was, I mean, to me was, was, I mean, I, I want to acknowledge that because that's, that's special. And sometimes we have to do things that, you know, others aren't prepared to do, you know, and it's, it's not easy. What about, um, what about you stepping into the league? So you, well, actually, you know what, before we even go there, let's talk about that trade because that was a huge, huge deal. Um, you know, swapping icons there, uh, Matt Sundin coming to Toronto and, and Clark going the other way and you being a big piece of that trade. How, how did that happen? Were you aware of it? I mean, what transpired afterwards, all that stuff. What do you remember about that moment in time? Well, we talked about Cliff Fletcher. And so I'm playing in the Olympic games. My mom and dad are there in Lillehammer and, um, and Cliff, uh, this is February. So keep in mind, it's February, late February. Cliff goes out of his way to find my mom and dad in the stands and sits behind him and says, uh, you know, Mr. Warner, I'm Cliff Fletcher. And of course, my parents know who he is. And they say, he says, well, we're really, really fond of Todd and, and uh, um, just having a great tournament kind of thing. Like we're going to try and make a, uh, make a splash at the draft and we'll, uh, and uh, he's part of the plans kind of thing. And my dad was just like, you know, okay, Mr. Fletcher, like, uh, so dad didn't tell me that, of course, until it was, you know, May later. And he's like, Hey, I, I meant to tell you that, Cliff Fletcher made a point of coming and sitting with us at the, at, the, at the game. And so we're watching the draft, your draft. And there was a guy named Chris Allen, who's from, who's from our area. And so my, my parents had worked with Chris a little bit uh, on the ice and Chris. Uh, so we went up to my granddad's in town. He's the only guy at TSN and we were watching the draft and when it all went down. So we, as we turn it on, you remember it happened before the draft even started. 
So as we turn the TV on, there's this talk about, you know, something happening on the floor, conversation between the Quebec table, Toronto table. And, and uh, so dad and I kind of look at each other like, oh, this might be it, you know? So sure enough, I get traded that day. And I'll never forget that. Like we hung around and watched the draft and we watched, uh, you know, the Chris Allen get picked. Like it was by Florida. And, um, but anyway, this just the whole, uh, the whole scene. And what I remember most is like when I was a Donnie Meehan client, one of his biggest guys was Wendell. And as a 17 year old in Windsor, Motor City, Smitty and Wendell Clark were buddies. And so Donnie Meehan rented an apartment to, to Wendell in, in his, uh, in his, uh, apartment building in Toronto. So I knew Wendell since I was 16. Um, and he was, you know, in this small hockey world, I got to know him as a kid and admired him. And I, I remember thinking, oh, it's too bad that I get to go to Toronto, but it's too bad that Wendell's not there. Cause I, that's the only guy I really knew. And so I'd had yeah. Chris Broadhurst, the trainer, look at my knee when I got hurt my knee in my draft year. And, and so I knew the Leafs a little bit, but I was mostly like so many disappointed that Wendell wasn't there anymore. <laughs> so so it was a thrill for me to come to Toronto, obviously, but, but I also, you know, with that came some responsibility. You get traded in a trade like that and you come with a guy like Matt Sandin. And, you know, I remember thinking, uh, wow, I'm going to get to play basically in my hometown, but, you know, obviously with that comes pressure and some expectation when you come to a, a program like the league. So I felt that a little bit too. And it took some time to really, um, you know, get my foot in the door and with Pat Burns, you know, it was difficult to get uh, as a young player to get a chance. And so it took some time, but I look back at my time in Toronto. We have played for three different coaches or four, I guess, really if you count Nick Beverly for a month, but so I, but I really enjoyed it and being part of the trade and the connection to Matt's, we've been lifelong friends and, but um, clearly at the time, I remember it, it dawned on me that, you know, the, my only real connection to the Leafs was, was Wendell and it's too bad that I wouldn't get a chance to play with him. And I loved watching him as a leaf too. Right. No. Yeah. He was, uh, he, how could you not like him? Right. I mean, he's just one of those guys that played, played a little old school, could definitely finish, you know, could, uh, could fight and, you know, you just anything you want him to do, he could do it. I, I mean, it was an honor for me when I came to Toronto that I had a chance to play with him a couple of times. I mean, I, to say you were, you were once a line mate of Wendell Clark is pretty cool. So, uh, I'll, I'll forever have that in my cap. You mentioned Matt's there, uh, Warrenzy. You know, do you knew him then? I guess from the you know from the training camps that you were involved in, right? So you were you were around there a little bit. Had, had you, I don't know, befriended each other? Like, was it was it on that level, or were you guys just more or less, you know, whatever, a part of yeah. the same organization? Yeah, no, <clears throat> excuse me, not really. I mean, I, I I knew I knew him, and we, you know, when you hang out in training camp you know what it's like you're you're a young player and he's he's a legit pro and and uh so yeah i i I knew matt's i think we played golf a couple times in camp and so i was really friendly enough with him but we weren't we were buddies he didn't call me the day that we got traded or anything but um but later on we we grew to be good friends and i you know matt's he's easy to get along with and and um yeah he so it, it it was um at that time, Matt, you forget how young Matt's was too. Like we're we're right. young when we're playing with Matt's, but Matt's is twenty four. You know, Matt's is twenty three when he comes to it. Like that's a that's a that's a heavy that's a heavy thing for a young guy to come to the Leafs and all of a sudden you're replacing Wendell Clark. Like I mean, I I talked about the pressure I felt, but imagine being Matt Sundin and being able to deliver. Like man, did he deliver, right? So I mean, just the way he handled himself. He's always, you know, Swedes, like the Swedes just have a way about them that's easy to like. They're good with the media. Um, you know, they're they're proud guys, but they're humble. Like, I, I just, I, I can't think of one that I played with that I don't think all those things about. And Matt's was that for sure. And it was good to me uh, and, and all the young guys that came in. Um, he didn't, he, he wasn't, uh, you know, he wasn't a vocal guy. He wasn't a guy that had always had a lot to say, but I think they're the best leaders anyway. He just went yeah. to work every day. He was a horse. He could not play him. And he delivered every time we needed him. And he was, he's just a special human being. So yeah. when I get lumped into that trade, people talk about the Sundin trade that my name's in there. I, I feel proud about that too. 
So yeah. I'm glad you mentioned that with Matt's because, you know, and I'm glad you even mentioned that, Hey, there's a, there's a lot of pressure involved in being in a trade like that. And there's a lot of pressure being young and trying to fit into, you know, what a Maple Leaf is and the expectations of a Maple Leaf and, and how far reaching that fan base is. And like where you, you really never leave a, a minute of your day without being somehow impacted by it. Um, yep. So like you to bring that up is cool, but like, I love the fact that you talked about that with Matt's because sometimes we have these guys that are on the pedestal of, you know, the sport, right? This is obviously an, an icon player, but he's still a 23 year old guy, you know, like, and so he's a heck of a player, but now he's going into that scenario in a, in a new environment, a new country. Right. And having to do that and deliver. And then he gets to see, and it's like, man, that does take a special person. And, and I mean, it, it's, I'm glad it gets celebrated and talked about a bit because sometimes you just, when I look back, I mean, I, I'm, you know, I'm bouncing around here, but when I look back and see how young he was, like, I didn't even realize that at the time. Yeah, I know. I know, you know he, I mean? carried, he carried himself like, uh, like Lidstrom or like right. Rory Salming. It was like, a, no, I get it. I, I, and you really only got to know Matt's when you were at his apartment in the afternoon. You know, like that's when he was relaxed and he was like, because it was, you know, he was the captain of the Leafs. He had yeah. to do things a certain way and he, it wasn't, he wasn't, wasn't lost on him. He knew. So, I, yeah, you forget, like, that would be a fair bit to take on. And thank God Dougie was there then. And when Dougie Gilmore was there, I think he probably helped him a lot. And I know he did and some of the older guys but you know that's you're the face of the franchise for that long and you gotta yeah. and, and you deliver and you say all the right things and you're a good teammate and you can't talk about yeah. them enough i remember walking uh wherever we would walk I and mean, we can't remember that bar that we'd go to sometimes but i mean you're with matt's and not only is he matt sundin but he's six foot four he's he's huge right like he stands up he's taller than everybody else blonde hair i mean you just he could not escape anything there right <laughs> the wallflower was, yeah, the wallflower. Exactly. You probably just prop them up in the corner. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, no, I'll tell you what I remember. How, how was how was that? So you you come to that team, and then I noticed that you you spent that first year almost exclusively in in the A. So you were in the Rock, right. and you got to spend some time there in Newfoundland. Um, what was what was your first year pro like? Because I mean, looking at the stats, it looks like maybe you didn't have not the very, best. Not very good. Yeah. 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 Well, I it was the lockout. We got, there was a lockout that happened right in the end of camp. I don't know if you remember. So I, that was my first camp. I, I'd gone, yeah, it was just, it couldn't have gone really worse. I, <laughs> I'd say like, you know, I was excited to come to Toronto and Pat Burns team that, you know, training camp was a certain way. I fell, no, I got hit in the face with a puck, third scrimmage. So like fourth day there or something, right in the face and it cut me and, and my eye closed over. So I, I couldn't skate for a day. I come back to, you know, a couple days later, and I've only got a sliver of a vision out of the one eye. Well, I fall into the boards and dislocate my shoulder. <laughs> so that's how my first training camp went. So I go to the so training camp breaks. You know, I'm still doing my rehab on my shoulder. It's dislocated. It's not like it's going to be healed any anytime soon. And I go to the minors and don't play for about a month. And I have like you know, you got the harness with this. You know, I don't know, remember the old harness where you couldn't put your and you had like the ropes all tied off. And so I played with that for a couple of months. And I, I mean, I literally, you couldn't even take a half slap or not that it mattered, but just not really healthy. And so my first, yeah, my first year in the minors, like was tough. I didn't play a lot. And even in the end, uh, come playoffs, I was on the, like the, I was the 10th forward for part of it. And that was Tom Watts team. And so, yeah, it was – so I, I, I was just playing golf the other day, Jay, with Matt Martin. And Maddie and I were roommates in St. John's in the minors playing Tom Watt. And that's – so, of course, the NHL is locked out. We're, we're a story on TSN. You know, like TSN's covering the big elites, if you can imagine. Right. So there was, a, there was a point mid-season where uh, – it's a long story, but um, re results of a bad Christmas party, we got benched. So Maddie and I were told to take our stuff off during the game. And that made national news. <laughs> that made national during news. The game? So during a game, at the at the end of the first period, or I forget, at the end of the first period, yes, Tom Watt wasn't happy with the way Maddie, Maddie and I were playing. Now this is I could get into a long winded story here. I want I'm not gonna throw anyone under the bus, but we uh, something happened away from the rink that ended up on our apparently it was our fault, but really wasn't. And so Tom, we weren't privy to that information at the time but he came in after first and said take your shit off you're done 
So Maddie and I looked at each other like, what? what? What's that all about? You know? And so anyway, we go home that night and we're watching, you know, TSN and it's, it's on TSN that we got, we got sat out Maddie Martin and I probably the two of the biggest prospects on the, at the least of the right. time. And so Maddie, of course, we're both pissed. And so, you know, agents calling what's going on down there. And so we had to, you know, anyway, so I have no problem with Tom Watt. I don't think I, I understand fully. Like I show up at his, his team in October after the lockout starts, all the guys go to the minors. I got a full on harness. I can't, I haven't hit a guy in a month. Like he's not, he doesn't look at me as a guy that's going to help him right away. And and that's the way, that's the way it works. You, know, you get hurt sometimes you lose, you lost in the shuffle. So, but then the next year I went back to camp. I thought I had a good camp. And, How was that? Uh, I'm going to cut you off there. Like, so you have a, a not a great yeah. experience as a pro, right? And you're battling, yeah. getting worn up, um, all that stuff. You I mean, I'm sure there's some belief going on, question marks, everything else. Did you, did you sort of revamp in the summer and say, Hey, you know, uh, let's rebuild this. Or like, what was your approach there to kind of get back to feeling yourself? Well, I had to get healthy. So a couple things I was, when I came to Toronto, I'd had a bad, had a bad ankle. So I, I told you, I, when I got hurt in the Olympics, I rolled my ankle and sort of told at the time, like you can, you can have surgery. Now there's some s- chips and things floating around in your joint. You can clean it out or you can just do your rehab. So imagine your March. I'm still with Quebec at this point. They want to bring me in to play some games. Now, I'm still on crutches when we get our medals, but I do my rehab three weeks, month later, I'm starting to skate. They send me to Cornwall. So what ends up happening is I spend the rest of that season in the minors in the American League. We go right to the semifinals. So I'm getting a chance to play pro hockey. In hindsight, probably should have my ankle cleaned out like right away when, when I heard it, but I'm, you know, I heard it in the Olympics with the idea that maybe I can get better quickly play in the Olympics and then had this opportunity to play pro and finish the year because the Olympics are over in February. So lots, you know, lots of opportunity. Mm-hmm. So I, I did not do that. I went back. So then my ankle of course was not, not good forever. You probably remember me doing all the nonsense I used to have to do to get it in escape. So that needed to get better. I did, I spent a summer in Toronto, that summer in Toronto with Chris Broders. Basically like I, I lived down there. I trained, I did all my rehab, shoulder and ankle, and I went to that camp that year. I thought I was I thought I was ready to play. But I got cut. And I remember being in Collingwood and Pat Burns called me in and and uh and he said we're not we're not keeping you, we're sending you down. And it was again like the you know, the eleventh hour, like with the league started in forty eight hours. So I was like, oh man, like I really felt like I played well enough to make it and I was sort of pleading my case and, and Burns he stopped me. Like you imagine, like I'm talking to Bernsey, like I'm, you know, I'm gonna, he's gonna change his mind, <laughs> right? Uh, anyway, it's just young, and uh, but I thought I played well enough, and he he stops and he goes, he goes, listen, the game doesn't owe you anything, okay? The game doesn't owe you anything. That's what he said to me in Collingwood with Mike Kitchen, and he, and you know, I look back on that now, like you know, I'm glad he said that to me. He wasn't really thrilled that I was he pleading my case. He probably just wanted to kick me out of the room, get to get the hell out of here, go play in the Myers. So then he says, game doesn't owe you anything. Go down there and play well, and then we'll see, kind of thing. That was it. And I went down, and it was a month, and I was back up, and that was kind of how I got my foot in the door. I was glad I pleaded my case, Jay, but you can imagine talking like the Pat Burns like that. Mm-hmm. He wasn't having it. But he made it, he, he made, made it known that I hadn't done anything to deserve anything, and he wasn't going to give it to me either. And it was probably the best thing I needed to hear at that point, too. So. Yeah, wow, that's pretty, pretty staunch <laughs> advice. Uh, I, I like yeah. that. And you, when you went down, you I mean, I mean, again, you can only see stat line on the on on the stats, but you I mean you had a point of game there in your second year in the AHL, and then they uh, they brought you up, you know, like which so they rewarded yeah. you. It looks like for for having a good start, and we're kind of a little bit true to their word. Yeah, I you know what I remember, and I, I was just saying to you, I was playing golf with Matt Martin the other day, and uh, Maddie was my roommate, and we're watching. It's late October, I want to say. I should know this. And Bill Berg, who's playing with the Leafs, I'm playing in St. John's, gets in a fight, but he breaks his leg. It's kind of a big story. You know, he folds up and he, and he gets hurt. And Maddie looks over at me on the couch. He's like, there's your chance. Maddie Martin, there's your chance. And, I, and so sure enough, the phone rang immediately, come down to the ring in the morning kind of thing. And I was like, all right. And so that was my, you know, how it works. Like we talked off the top, like how many guys 
didn't have someone in their court or something like that doesn't happen and you spend another year in the minors and then it's and then it's you're 22 and you know now like if you're not in there by the time you're 24 it's really tough to not be just a part-time guy so yeah. you get your foot in the door and it's a pat burns team you know how it works i had to pay my dues and keep my mouth shut and lived in the hotel for four months you know but that's okay and and um eventually I got a, to be an NHL regular and that's just, that's just part of the deal. That was just part of the deal. So I'm glad yeah. I went through all that. You know? Yeah. Oh, well, you had a long time. So you had to go play more AHL games. You know I mean? Looking at that and I saw you played in Manitoba yeah. where I spent some time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. A good place there. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's Love awesome. There. You got up there and obviously did you think that you, like when you had that opportunity, which wasn't your first game, cause you had some games the year before, but I mean, you got up there now in your second year, did you, like how how did that go? Did you feel like you earned it? Did you feel like you were you know a, a piece of it, or or how did you end up solidifying yeah. your spot there? I mean, I not I wouldn't say you know like Pat Pat made me earn it. Like I I, I wouldn't say I lit lit it on fire. I scored in in the first game I got called up that year, which probably helped my case a little bit. But Pat, you know, Pat wasn't gonna was gonna hand you anything. You know, you know how he was, especially with young players. So I just went about my business there I probably sat out a third of the games roughly and then Pat got fired is what happened and then you know Nick Beverly took over the team I played in the playoffs regular that year but you know it was still hit and miss like I was still trying to prove myself I mean it's it was a long go and and it wasn't until the next year when when really Mike Murphy took over the team that I played that I was in the lineup you know, and then after that, you know, again, I got hurt, that injury and yeah, lots of things happened, but I mean, you know, you know, really, yeah, that first year was just trying to prove the pad that I could be. And I learned, I had to learn so many things, you know, you come out of junior, all, all I wanted to do was skate and shoot. I'm like, well, well, you're going to play for Pat. You got to do more than that. You got to be conscientious and smart and hard to play against and all the things that we all need to learn coming out of junior. Right. Mm. And so I'm glad I, t- I tell people I'm glad to play for Pat. They're like, well, Pat never wanted anybody under 30 on his team. So I'm like, yeah, but, but I was on the team. You just yeah. had to prove to him that I could be reliable. And that was hard, as, hard, as you know, right. but, um, so I, I, I look back on that first year is probably the reason I was able to play as long as I did. So if I, I don't learn those skills and I'm not a regular NHL or later. Yeah, I know. Great point. Uh, I got, a. I got a question here from from somebody from somebody uh, in the group, and they say, "How intimidating was it to walk into the Leafs locker room uh, with the likes of Sunday and Anderchuk, Gilmore, Gartner, Murphy, to name a few?" Um, especially on that call up, I mean, because that's something that maybe doesn't get talked about either. You know, you you yeah. you probably felt like you belonged maybe in your own head potentially, potentially not. But now you're not a part of that team. You get that phone call. Now you got to walk in with your bag and. You know, you're you're uh, you're joining all these guys that you've watched on TV and and what have you, and you're now you're a part of them. Like, how, what was that like? Well, I remember training camp. I remember the first training camp and just uh, you know being around. Like, I'm sort of Mats and I and Garth Butcher. We're kind of all we're we're together in this group of guys that came in the trade. You know, so we're kind of like so we, we're we're we we'll chat with each other, but we're also trying to meet all the guys. And for me. You know, I'd watch the team go to the conference finals the you know, prior two years, and I, you know, I was a fan of Dougie and Wendell, and I knew, you know, I knew all these guys too from afar. So it was a one month period of time, and then again another training camp. So I'm in my fourth training camp at this point. Like, you know, I I know most of the guys. Second one in Toronto, I know most of the guys pretty well. So it's not like you're coming in from a trade like when you get traded later within the league and you walk into a room of guys you just played a week prior and you're telling them to go and screw themselves well it's different so yeah. i've been to training camp and everything else you know how it works yeah. so so they welcomed me I, I remember mike gartner coming over to me i saw mike the other day too just a, you know just a great veteran that you know everybody respected you remember mike and and he come over to me and said good luck first of many you know kind of thing and just just stuff like that that you always you always remember from a veteran guy that took the time to do that yeah. Um, and that was, that was not my first NHL game, but that was my first that particular year. And, and, um, so yeah, it was, you know, it was a team that knew how to win and Pat liked his teams to play a certain way. So I had, I was aware of that and I, I was again, fully prepared to do whatever I needed to do and, and was really, you know, happy to get out of the minors to be fair and, and, sure. and get a chance. So it was like, uh, I'm not going to waste it. I'm not going to yeah. waste it. Right. So. 
Yeah, and I think that's, I mean, I can totally relate. And I'm glad you you did the differentiation there because with with Florida, you mean when I was up and down on a personal level, I'd gone to camp with all those guys. I mean, even the even the prospects, right? So we've been together for three years essentially, and I knew Van Beesbrook and Scrudland and Paul Laus sure. and these guys. So when I went up, it wasn't like this big wow, right? Because I knew them. I, I knew them enough to feel comfortable, right? But when I got traded to you guys and never been a part of that organization, never been to camp with any of you, never knowing the coaches or any of the players, like that was a big wide eye opener, right? Because there's now there's 30 some people that you're meeting for the first time when you're 20 years old and you're in Toronto. It's a way different experience than than a regular call up, let's say, you know, that trade. And I know you experienced that later with uh, with Tampa as well. What um I think we should do it. I know you've told this story before, but I mean, it always gives me a chuckle. I haven't used it yet, but uh, one touch was 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 what you were uh, affectionately oh, yeah. called when uh, oh, when yeah. I came up there, and I heard the story. You didn't tell the story <laughs> actually, but I did hear the story when I was when I was with the Leafs. And it, would you be so kind as to tell us how how one touch came to be? Because I think that's a pretty sure. awesome one for hockey lore. Well, it's you know, it's one of my it's one of the things like when I'm when I'm at home with my the friends I grew up with, I never hear it. It's only when I go to alumni events or like I see some of my old boys that it's like, hey, one touch, you know, and I, 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 I'll go months without hearing it. And then right. I'll, and I'll hear it and it's great. So we're in New Jersey. This is probably my 15th or 20th game of that year. It's in, in the fall. <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, Todd. This is Sheeran, your rookie. This is my rookie. rookie, I mean, rookie so this rookie, is right. within weeks of getting called up with Pat. So Pat's yeah. giving me a chance. Todd Gill rounds the net. I'm like a good any good winger jay anchored on the on the half wall ready for my breakout pass well i could feel like there's guys closing on me i'm gonna i'm so i bump pump it right back to him one touch the pass from todd gill right back to todd as he's coming around the net thinking i was a smart thing to do to get away from the pressure one touch the pass you hear it you see it all the time now so bad idea puck puck rolls and it hit, goes over giller's stick and it gets shot into the front of the net and it hits one of our guys and goes in the net so one nothing in New Jersey. In New Jersey in 1995 is like a 4 nothing lead today. Like they're going to lock it down and beat you one nothing if they can. Yeah. So Pat comes in. You remember the old dress room in, the, in Continental Airlines. So there's like a big wooden island, all the tape and, and juice on it. And I'm stepped behind the door that goes into the, the door that goes into the trainer's room, right? So I'm behind the door and I can just see a little bit of the island and Pat starts yelling at me and Todd. There's only two effing guys in this league who can make one touch passes, but he's walking now around thinking he's gonna wants to yell at me, but he can't figure out where I am in the room. He's gone all the way around, <laughs> right? So finally, he comes over the door. He goes, oh, "There's two guys in this league, Gretzky and Lemieux," and he's looking right at me. And last I checked, you weren't one of them. And then he goes <laughs> in. Then he goes into the end of the training room. So Jay, the best part of this story is the next week in practice, Ben Wahog. You remember Benny? Benny says, I scored a goal or whatever in practice. And Benny goes in his French accent, add away, one touch. You know? <laughs> All right. So, so guys start to chuckle, but they're not laughing because they don't think it, maybe Bernsey thinks it's funny, right? Yeah. So then, of course, Mike Gartner later in practice, he said, and he's like, way to go, one touch. You know, and the guys start, <laughs> start chuckling, right? So Bernsey, I don't even make eye contact with Bernsey, of course. And I go down. This is a half hour into practice. I'm going down by the visiting bench at the old gardens. And uh, I see him coming, Jay, out of the corner. Pat's coming out of the corner of my eye. And I'm like, oh, my God. I hope, I hope he thought that was funny because if he doesn't think it's funny, I could be on the train to Newfoundland. You know what I mean? So I see him coming. I don't even look at him. I got my you know hand, stick down on my pants, and I see him coming out of the corner of my eye, and he shuffles right in beside me. This is Pat Burns. He's probably spoken to me for three seconds total in my life. <laughs> he shuffles shuffles right in beside me and he doesn't really look at me i can just see him he goes well looks like you got a nickname eh, kid and then he skated away <laughs> <laughs> and i'll never forget that that was the first time i really thought wow like pat burns might like me <laughs> yeah right <laughs> right yeah he took maybe. the time maybe that is awesome i love this only two players in this league and you're not one of them i think yeah. Lush was a guy who actually told me that story he must have heard it from before but hey, my anyway. gonna die my iPad's gonna die. I gotta put you in. Okay. Is that all right? Yeah, no worries, man. <laughs> um, you can still hear me, obviously, right? Oh yeah, I got you. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so we, we uh, 
it's interesting the connection. I don't even know if you remember this next one because I we 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 talked before we got off that you were we were kind of similar ish players. I mean, you you like to rely on your speed. You're a good skater, good shooter, and we were similar height and weight too. And uh, and yeah. when we when when I got traded there originally, one of the things that I still to this day don't really know why. After those ten games, Mike Murphy took me aside and he thought that I was out of shape somehow. And that was just one thing that I really oh. never was. And uh, and he said, uh, you know, go to go to work this summer, and you know, come back in better shape, and we'll see we'll see what happens. And so we, I did come can back that hear? next year. And, okay. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. And so, you. Sure. you know, the way it goes with all the fitness testing that we did there, and they did the Wingate and the VO two and blah blah blah. And anyways, I finished second to you that next camp. You you were you won the oh, yeah. uh, the gold medal for best in shape, and I won a PlayStation for second place or whatever. So uh... <laughs> I remember. <laughs> Oh, we lost uh, we lost Todd here. Hope we'll give him a second. We just he just changed location, and uh, we'll let him get back in here to the feed. In the meantime, uh, yeah, Warren's just, just an awesome, awesome guy, super down to earth. Uh, as you can see from the conversation, we'll uh, we'll give him a second to get back on here and uh, wrap things up. Yeah, and Todd was like, I know he's not on here now and he can't hear me, but he was one of the guys that did, when I went to Toronto, that was like super kind and really nice and, and made made my life easier there. He was one to invite, invite me out for a dinner or invite me out for a beer after. And uh, and yeah, I mean, being a part of that group, you know, was was real nice. He was, he was always in the training room, taking care of an injury that he would have or something, trying to keep himself in the lineup. And so he was... Uh, and when we came in early that one year, he was one of the guys that I was working out with quite a bit. So uh, Todd and I did spend a little bit of time there in my short time in in Toronto, and I'm sure he's trying to get uh, get himself all wired up here so he can come back on. It's funny the the issues with going live. We'll cut this out for the um, normal podcast. But for those of you who are watching, just try and bear with us here. Let's see if I can get him on the phone. Oh, there he is. Hey, buddy. All right, we got Sorry. you. No worries. What a joke. Y'all so hooked I plugged up? it in, but the the light was off or something, so the the outlet didn't work. My fault. Oh. <laughs> can, you, can you crop this together? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We're live, but we can crop it for the podcast, so no big deal. We'll just cut it out. Okay. Sorry. Um, <laughs> one touch. One of the users says that's a pretty funny story. One touch. Yeah, I mean that's awesome. I can imagine being twenty years old. Can you not hear me now? Hold on. I gotta get my. I gotta get my ear. But no problem, man. I got you. Okay, sorry, bud. Jeez, Louise. <laughs> Thank God my wife's here yeah. to help me. Yeah, that's all good. It's all good. <laughs> yeah, I know we were just you were just laughing about uh, kicking my butt in the fitness testing there and taking the uh, taking the the number one spot on the podium. <laughs> oh yeah. So what I remember is like, do you remember at the? It was like at a dinner where they announced it and everybody was booing me. <laughs> <laughs> I had to go up and get the get the award and they're like boo. <laughs> no, I mean, I that's not my chick pride, and like that's just another thing. Like, you go back to the national team with Pauly. Like, Pauly was really keen into how to train and like, at, at the forefront of all that. Like, I learned that from him. And and you know, when you're you're in your second year in the minors, and you're trying to you're trying to you're in a new organization, and you you do whatever you can, man. And so I took my summers serious, and and I knew if I could eliminate one other thing and, and it would give me a better chance to make it then yeah so I, I took that stuff seriously and that's probably the reason i was able to play till i was 35 because i got hurt a lot you know like mm. i had knee and shoulder and wrist and so i had the, i had to really sort of fine-tune that fitness part of it and then you know learn what my body was compared to other guys and how to train and because it's everybody's different I and mean, when you have an ankle problem and a shoulder problem and a knee problem and you're wearing two braces, you have to do 
you have to train a little differently, right? So it's so I, I learned all that pretty young, and so I took that part of it uh, pretty serious. Yeah, I know. And when you were off, I mentioned that we worked out quite a bit together that one year I came in a little bit early and because I wanted to, like what you just said there, right? Yeah. I mean, one kind of take care of the business and be around the guys a little bit more. And and then that was interesting too, because then from that perspective on on my side, like I had a good camp um, for sure and was like scoring goals and doing the things and like won the you know, second place in the fitness testing. And I was like, all right, you know, like kind of here we go. And then it wasn't just wasn't happening there, you know, but that down you go and, you know, down relatively early and uh, trying to bang your <laughs> yeah. way around. But as, as uh, Pat Burns well, says, the game about just being up. that's right. I mean, that's the thing, like, you know, you go to a new place and you're always trying to, you know, find a way to fit. Like, you know, I tell kids now, like you gotta, you gotta, you know, make an impact. And there's lots of ways to make an impact. You know, like there's lots of ways to get noticed. Right. And then if it means sometimes you got to fight or you got to do something a little bit out of character. So, um, you know, find you have to. And I think part of it is just having an understanding of like looking at a team and going, what do they need? And can you do that? You know, can you provide that? And then maybe you get a chance you wouldn't have got. So that's a skill, too. You know, it's like recognizing, mm -hmm. uh, you know, being able to, to adapt and change and, and bring something else to the table is is part of the reason. You know, a lot of guys have careers and a lot of guys don't. If they're a little bit stubborn, that can be that can be an issue. You know what I mean? Like, you know, lots yeah. of guys like that. So, sure. I mean, have, being adaptable and being able to recognize what a team might need in a certain year is, is a skill. All right. Thank you so much for being here today. I apologize for the way that that episode ended. Obviously, in this day and age, there's nothing much you can do when it comes to battery power and Internet service. So we had to cut that one short. Uh, I know that was a great, a great conversation. And again, there was so much more that I wanted to get into, uh, especially with the European side of the game. I, I don't think enough people really cover that and talk about that as an alternative uh, for pro hockey. What a great experience it is over there. So I'd love to hear what Todd had to say about it, as well as all the other stops on, on, his, uh, on his NHL journey, not to mention what he's doing now as a broadcaster for Sportsnet, uh, covering the Memorial Cup and, and these other events and the, and the Leafs that he, that he likes to cover and also the Battle of the Blades. So there was a lot more we could have got into with Todd, but I, I do think that what he shared was, was pretty cool. You know, he was at the top, the pinnacle of the sport uh, in his draft year, uh, made some waves, um, winning a silver medal with, uh, with Canada, and then figuring out how to play at the NHL level. Even somebody with as big of a resume as Todd uh, had a challenge, you know, to get into that top six position and even to cement his his way into the league. And and he himself said that, you know, what if it wasn't for a guy like Cliff Fletcher, who knows where I would have been? Cliff Fletcher happened to like me and he kept bringing him to places that he was GM. And that makes that makes a difference. So Todd's a humble guy, a grateful guy, genuine guy. And I really enjoyed having him on. And if you want to follow me, there has been quite a few questions. So this episode uh airs we, we put it on youtube as well so if you ever want to watch uh you know the, uh, the conversation uh in action you can watch that on youtube if you want to follow me personally i'm on uh, instagram at jason padolan uh there's also a website upmyhockey.com that gets into my programs for young athletes that gets into kind of what i'm about uh from a, from an educational and development standpoint and if you are a hockey player uh, parent out there, and if you are navigating this journey and you are doing the best to support your kid and you know want the best for your athlete, I, I have a group that I'm really proud of on Facebook called the Up My Hockey Parent Group uh, that is uh, going to membership. And it's a scenario where I bring in experts every month uh, on topics that are vital, I think, to young athletes in their development. Uh, sometimes the topic pertains to parents. I also do trainings myself on things that I feel are important with mindset and the belief system and confidence. And, uh, and it's also a place where you get to listen to these interviews or some of them uh, live and you get access to the guests, my guests, and you get to ask your own questions within the group. So there's a lot of good stuff going on in there. So once again, at uh, Instagram, it's at Jason Padolan. Facebook, it is uh, Up My Hockey Parent Group if you're a parent. And uh, out there on the internet, uh, my URL is upmyhockey.com. So uh, that's where you can find me uh, other than this podcast. And thanks again for tuning in. Thanks for listening. And until next week, play hard. Keep your head up.